to the dignified guests in the rooms, sirs, ma'ams, to all the members of the audience, it is my honor to be part of the seminar today and speak in front of you. Before I start, I would like to introduce myself first. So as stated by Kus earlier, I'm, my name is Officer Cadet Jared Nicolasara from the Philippine Air Force. So prior to entering the academy, my original plan was to join the Army. But as luck would have it, when I was selected for ADFA, they sent me to the Air Force. And the bigger irony is that I don't have any prior knowledge of flying an aircraft, and more importantly, I'm scared of heights. And so for pilot training next year, that's next year's problem. So, nevertheless, here I am today in front of a room full of military experts and intellectuals. So for today, I'll be giving a presentation on the topic, how advancements in technology have shaped the application of air power in regular conflicts. The motivation for this presentation was a course I did last semester, Air Power in Small Wars, which by far has been the most interesting course I've had here in ADFA. Also, with the current service I'm in and the prevailing insurgency threats I would have to face back home, this topic is one close to my heart. My presentation will first give a general overview of how advancements in air technology have improved the application and delivery of air power. I'll then give a chronological review of this application throughout the different time frames. So the first period I will be discussing will be the 20th century colonial air campaigns, namely the French operations in Morocco and the British colonial air policing in Somaliland and Iraq. Next, this presentation will analyze post-World War II counterinsurgency operations, where we bear witness to refinements in the application of air power as well as technological innovations in support of these counterinsurgency campaigns. Lastly, I will, talk, I will be taking a quantum leap and discuss contemporary operations against Islamic extremism, such as those in Operation Enduring Freedom. I will also be talking about the Battle of Marawi in the southern Philippines last year. This conflict shows how even a relatively less equipped Air Force was able to fast track the end of the conflict through effective application of its limited air assets. Air power has been able to adapt to rapid changes in warfare through new operational concepts, capabilities development, and technological ad advancements. So Dr. Sanu Kanikara, who's with us today, considers Operation Desert Storm in 1991 as a prime example of how continuous development in technology and doctrine throughout the years prior to the conflict led to an overwhelming, overwhelming victory with the coalition forces. So as stated earlier, the core capabilities of air power are being delivered through more efficient means due to the evolution of modern aircraft and weaponry. For, for example, most irregular conflicts almost always guarantees air superiority for government forces. However, this superiority remains as a primary prerequisite for effective application of these operations. The increased range of air-to-air -air missiles, for example, further enhances the air superiority Priority bubble of these aircraft. So strike operations are also now, now more accurate, which is important to reduce collateral damage in support of the basic tenets of in any counterinsurgency, counterinsurgency campaign, which is winning the hearts and minds of the people. The quicker action time to deliver strike operations also ensures that the highly mobile na nature of these insurgents is countered. So in terms of airlift, larger and faster aircraft enables better mobility for, tr for troops in operations. This also enables a more rapid and effective tactical insertion of special forces units into the battlefield. Lastly, modern ISR capabilities provide information from a longer range and establish an overhead intelligence umbrella, thus enabling better decision superiority for troops on the ground. At a tactical level, technology inherent in current modern aircraft makes it easier to find, fix, target, and neutralize the target, thus reducing target cycling time. On a strategic level, national security is heavily dependent on the power projection and rapid mobility offered by air power. However, technological superiority can only do so much against an under yet, yet determined group of insurgents, as will be discussed later on. I will now discuss the interwar period where aircraft played an important part role in the early 20th, 20th century colonial air campaigns. Having been used heavily in the First World War, 
for bombing, ground attack, and air superiority missions, airplanes have been deemed by the major powers as an important component of their military strategy. The collapse of the Ottoman Empire meant that the European powers had to use military force in order to pacify the growing sentiments of their newly acquired mandates and colonies. Whilst the French airmen were able to pioneer innovations in the use of air aircraft, it was the British who proved more adept in harnessing air-to-ground operations. Despite these major powers possessing state-of-the-art aircraft at that time against an ill-equipped enemy, overall strategy and effect effective employment of air power was, were still what determined the success or failure of these campaigns. The French campaign in Morocco against the forces of Abed el Krim during the Reef rebellions in the 1920s was not entirely more successful than their Spanish predecessors, although its strategy did show greater ingenuity in its deployment of air power. The French Army Air Service, since the Air Force wasn't a separate branch of service at that time, emphasis, emphasized the integration of air power in conjunction with ground operations. The ability of aircraft to resupply French blockhouses enabled these isolated outposts to maintain its positions. French aircraft were also used for photography and sending messages between the different French units. One of its more prominent innovations, however, was the conversion of its bomber aircraft, such as the Breguet, into air ambulances. For example, this latter development has resulted to 987 wounded and six soldiers being brought to the rear in 1928. On the downside, the French Air Service performed poorly in aerial artillery spotting and an insufficient number of radios resulted to less efficient air-to-ground operations. Constant bombings by the French aircraft saw only limited success against the well-dug-in Reef Rebels, given the small payload that its main bomber, the Breguet 14, could carry, which had a max of just 660 pounds payload. Despite Mar Marshal Padain's grand offensive in 1926, al Krim was able to stave off two large European powers, only being overcome later on due to, due to overwhelming firepower and numbers of the European powers. I will now move on to the British Royal, Royal Air Force's operations in their colonies. So having needed to forego operations against the Mad Mullah in Somaliland during the First World War, the British decided to resume operations and brought in a squadron of DH-9 reconnaissance light bomber aircraft to the protectorate in the autumn of 1919. These aircraft were used in continuous bombing raids against Mad Mullah sports, eventually leading to his catapulation into Ethiopia, where he died the following year. On a larger front, the British colonial policing of Iraq highlighted the limitations of current air power in operations against these colonial rebels. With the British taking heavy losses and entire outposts being wiped out, the Kurd and Arab rebels proved to have larger amounts of firepower and better strategy, making them more impervious to airstrikes compared to the rebels in Somaliland. These campaigns bear witness to early lobbies of air power as, you, as a humane way to conduct operations for irregular warfare. One of the arguments in support of this proposal is that air power could deliver discriminate destruction against specific targets. This could not be farther from the truth at that time, since the lack of bomb sites for early aircraft, such as the Bristol fighters, did not permit such accuracy. In fact, of the 182 bombs dropped on tribesmen during 1928 in the northwestern frontier, 102 of these missed their targets. So another advantage that the use of aircraft showed was its cost effectiveness. At a cost of just 80,000 pounds, the entire campaign against the Mad Mullah brought a strategic victory for the British. Michael A. Longoria, who wrote on the British experience between the wars, said that for Great Britain, the origin of the air policing clearly demonstrate that necessity is the mother of invention. The invention was air control, and its necessity was driven by the national requirement to reduce military spending. Now, I'll be talking about two separate air campaigns in irregular conflicts post-World War II. The, the Royal Air Force in Malaysia and the French in Algeria. One of the few examples of a successful counterinsurgency counter campaign is the Malayan Emergency, from 1948 to 1960. Contemporary security scholars still study the crucial elements of this campaign, which included population control, winning the hearts and minds through minimum force, political concessions, social provision, 
effective leadership, and the need for adaptive security forces. During this conflict, the RAF had a composite mix of aircraft at its disposal, which included World War II-era aircraft, such as the Spitfires and Lincoln bombers, and more modern aircraft, such as the Canberra and Vampire bombers. They also used rotary wing aircraft and light and medium transports, transports such as the C-47 Dakotas. Diverse weather conditions and the terrain limited the effectivity of RAF air power. Thus, interdiction operations against the Malayan Communist Party were severely hindered. The most significant limiting factor for these operations, however, was the elusiveness and mobile nature of these guerrilla forces. For instance, even with accurate intelligence of enemy location, 709,000 pounds of ordnance dropped by the RAF against the Tens Phuc Long, this only resulted to four casualties from these bombings. Direct actions against the communist guerrillas may have been limited, but RAF air power played more importantly through harnessing its advanced capabilities through indirect methods. By using aircraft, for example, to broadcast announcements as part of its psyops, 70% of surrendering rebels said that these voice flies directly affected their decision to surrender. Advances in ISR capabilities during this campaign also improved aerial reconnaissance missions, being able to locate 155 confirmed guerrilla camps. Active air defense in this campaign also meant extending government presence in its area of operations. The increased mobility served well to enable support missions such as transport, supply drops, medevac, and command and control. The need for air superiority in regular warfare was also emphasized in this conflict, given the vulnerability of these early air aircraft to inexpensive small arms and handheld anti-aircraft weapons of the MCP. The French campaign in Algeria against the Front de Libération Nationale started with terrorist attacks in French colonies and assassination of French citizens. Its experience in Indochina has already emphasized the role of air power in counterinsurgency. In this campaign, which stretched from 1954 to 1962, the French pioneered the large-scale use of helicopter in its operations. Rotary wing aircraft, such as the Sikorsky H-19s, could carry 12 or more soldiers into battle. And these were complemented with H-21 banana gun gunships, such as, such as that in the picture, which had two by 30-inch rocket pods, providing cover fire for troop insertion. This war also showed that most advanced aircraft were not always the more most appropriate platforms for counterinsurgency campaigns. For example, the French Air Force preferred to modify the T T6 trainer over the more advanced F86 jets, since this had slower speed and better loiter time, which was more appropriate for counterinsurgency. The magnitude of French air superiority did produce results after 1956, where errors at the top and bottom of the command were overridden by the sheer weight of French air power. This conflict, however, is a prime example of how the French, despite its air superiority, did win the battle but lost the war. Although civic actions put many of the Algerians in the side of the French, and effective air-to-ground operations were executed, the mounting pressure from this resistance is what led to the French government to abandon this territory and eventually grant Algeria its independence. I will now come to the final part of my presentation, which talks about con contemporary operations against Islamic extremism. The employment of air power in the US-led global war on terrorism Operation Enduring Freedom shows high-end air technology being capitalized and constantly de developed in order to systemat systematically defeat Taliban and Al-Qaeda insurgents in Afghanistan. The latter conflict, which I will talk about, details the Philippine Air Force's operations in the southern Philippines, which saw government forces battling a large, heavily equipped, and tactical, tactical proficient group of Islamic militants. The start of America's global war on terrorism on October 7 was initiated by bombing pre-planned targets in Herat, Shindad, Shibargan, Mazar-e Sharif, and the southern Taliban stronghold of Kandahar. By day 11, the war shifted its strategy from attacking fixed targets to actively seeking and destroying enemy troop concentrations and vehicles in designated engagement zones. The heavy use of forward air controllers to coordinate these bombings and insertion of a small number of special forces saw an innovation in the use of air power in a regular war. 
Data fusion also came into age during this campaign, with most operations being conducted under an overarching ISR umbrella that stared down relentlessly in search of enemy activity. Operation Enduring Freedom was a perfect setting to validate new concepts of air operations and test a variety of new weapons and ISR technologies. For example, the use of the MQ-1 Predator UAVs for ISR and strike operations by the CIA in Afghanistan manifests the pioneer use of this technology against Al-Qaeda. The mountain hideouts of Al-Qaeda also expedited the use of new air-delivered earth-penetrating weapons, such as the AGM-86D cruise missiles, GBU-24 laser-guided laser bombs, and BLU-118B penetrating warheads. Lightning imaging and targeting systems in F-16 also enabled laser marking for targets, reducing any chance of misidentifying targets. This contributed greatly to reduce collateral damage and fratricides, especially since, since, since these bombs were dropped in close proximity to friendly forces. Air power, however, did not always result to assure death from above, above since more experienced Al-Qaeda fighters took steps to reduce their exposure to air attacks. They used systematic communi communication security, dispersal, camouflage discipline, and exploitation of dummy fighting positions to draw far attention away from their real disposition. Thus, precision strikes became less effective, and there was an increased need for close ground combat. The last conflict that I will be talking about will be the Battle of Marawi last year. On May 23, 2017, members of the ISIS affiliated Mauti group and the extremist Abu Sayyaf group captured the Islamic city of Marawi in the southern Philippines. The, Filip the Philippine government took painstaking steps to retake the city, and the siege lasted for five months, with government casualties at 168 dead and 1,400 wounded. This campaign provides a very crucial and contemporary example of air power being utilized as a game changer component in the armed forces of the Philippines strategy for defeating these terrorist groups. In order to fully comprehend the crucial role played by the Philippine Air Force, it is important first to consider challenges the AFP faced against a large, heavily equipped, and well-prepared enemy. Firstly, the urban structures of the city were built from heavy concrete due to the fortifications of these buildings by its inhabitants against tribal feud. These were utilized by the militants to their advantage and acted as well-emplaced bunkers. The vantage positions of the enemy also compromised government's movements and proximity to friendly and civilians posed challenges in the delivery of close air support. There was also the presence of a vast tunnel system, which gave enemies easy access to critical areas in the city. Also, at the time of the conflict, the Air Force only had 500-pound general-purpose bombs in its disposal. And these were not enough to destroy these structures in single sorties. Even the newly acquired FA-50 jets only delivered on con continuously computed release point systems, employing only dumb bombs. Limited, the limited night capability of air, uh, the other air assets also did not allow bomb runs during the night. These situations may have been advantageous for government forces when the enemy were recovering. Assets such as the AW-109 attack helicopters had night, night capability, but as you can see, they only had 2.75-inch high-explosive rockets and 50-caliber machine guns, which could only do so much against these heavily fortified structures. Thus, the Air Force took lead in overcoming the obstacles posed by this urban terrain and utilized enemy vantage points at critical avenues of approach. Aircraft were able to take out enemy defensive actions such as IEDs and booby traps, which were placed on tanks and vehicles, and conducted bomb runs prior to troop advance. Attrition among the government forces was also lessened, with C-130 transport and UH-1 UA helicopters bringing critical logistics from the different Philippine Air Force bases to augment, to augment the depleting supply. Air Force operations also provided a psychological advantage for troops on the ground, due to the knowledge that air cover was constant and forward-looking infrared radiometer was available day in and day out. The Royal Australian Air Force and the U.S. Armed Forces provided much-needed ISR capabilities for the Philippine Air Force. Although there was, although there was a delay in this information reach, reaching the Philippine Air Force units, 
due to the lack of interoperable communications and data transfer systems. Even with the lack of more technologically advanced aircrafts, the Air Force, Philippine Air Force, through the adaptive and courageous nature of its personnel, and with assistance from its coalition partners, played a crucial role in ending what would have been a longer and bloodier campaign. Throughout this presentation, I've discussed irregular conflicts throughout three different time, pe time periods, which show the role of technological advancements in air power to achieve the evolving needs of the modern battle space. From its limited roles in supporting ground troops, technology inherent in current aircrafts make it the most vile means of response for government in regular conflicts today. Wilkinson and Hill's Air Power Actions for Irregular Conflict summarizes these learning points. First, they say that the tactical air power is only relevant in a regular conflict when it achieves political ends. Next, they say that population-centric conflict requires aircraft missions and operation concepts at the bottom of the evaluation scale, more than those at the top. Lastly, the choice of weapon and the rules for its use must be in harmony. These concepts go to show that far from the high-end warfighting dogma of conventional warfare, the use of technology and air power in irregular conflict should always be used to support security and stability at the lowest and at a holistic level, and not as a st separate strategy per se. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I'll now entertain questions. Thank you. <laughs>